Let's create a procedural mesh for our voxel terrain using a ray mesh in Godot. First, we'll draw a single cube from scratch, then expand to generate the entire terrain. We'll optimize it to only draw what's necessary, and you'll see just how easy it is to add collision to. The project files for this video are, as always, available through selected tiers on Patreon. And now, let's get started. We can create a mesh from code a number of ways in Godot, but in this tutorial, we will see how we can do this using a mesh instance 3D and an array mesh. The process can be divided into three steps. First, we need to prepare the array mesh using a few helper arrays. Then we generate the mesh data, and finally, we commit the generated data to the array mesh. So let's first add a mesh instance 3D node to our world scene. And from the inspector menu, we then create a new array mesh for the mesh property. And then I'm also adding a script to the mesh instance. Now we're ready to create the helper arrays we need for the array mesh. First, we need an array where all the other arrays will be connected before everything is committed to the mesh. I'm calling this surface array. The surface array will end up being a nested array, but since we can't specify this as a type in Godot, we'll just say that the type should be an array, but not what the type of the elements in the array should be. Godot will expect the surface array to have a specific size. So in the ready method, I'm resizing the array using the mesh.arrayMax constant. Now we should create the arrays we'll be putting our generated mesh data in at first. In this tutorial, we will be creating vertices, normals, and colors for each face of the cubes. But you could also add other data, such as UV coordinates to each vertex. You can read more about this in the documentation. So let's create a new array for the vertices. This should be a packed vector 3 array. And then an array for the normals. This should also be a packed vector 3 array. And finally, an array for the colors. This should be a packed color array. With these new arrays, we've made all the initial preparations required for our array mesh. The next step is to generate the data for the mesh. For this, we'll be creating a new method called generate mesh. This is where we'll be adding our generation algorithm later on. The last step is to commit the generated mesh data to our mesh. I'm creating a new method for this called commit mesh. And then I'm calling this from the generate mesh method. To commit the mesh, we'll first need to add all the generated data to our surface array. This has to be done on specific indices in the array, which can be done using the array type enum from the mesh class. Once this is done, we can then commit the data to the mesh using the add surface from arrays method. The first input specifies the primitive type we want to draw with, and in our case, this is triangles. And then the second input is our surface array. And now we should be ready to generate our first mesh. Before we start generating our whole terrain, it's best to just create a single cube first. This will make it easier for us to debug what's going on and make sure that our base cube data is correct. To create a cube, we need the positions of each vertex in the cube, what vertices each face of the cube consists of, and what the normal vector for each face is. We'll also be defining a color for each face, to make it easier for us to debug this first mesh. The coordinate system in Godot is right-handed, 
This means that we have the y-axis going up, and if the x-axis is increasing to the right here, then the z-axis will move towards us. I want our cube to be centered around 0 in all directions, and the length of each side should be 1. From this, we then get these positions for each of the vertices in the cube. I'm also enumerating the vertices like this to make all the next steps a bit easier. Okay, so now that we've determined the positions of the vertices, let's add these to a new array called cube vertices. Next, we'll be adding data per face, and to make this a bit easier, I'm quickly making a new enum called face and adding a value for each of the cube's six faces. Now we can create a dictionary with the vertex indices used to create each face. Each face will be drawn using two triangles, so for each face I'm creating an array with two arrays in them, one for each triangle used to create the face. The next step is where I always end up spending most of my debugging time later on. We need to determine what vertices will be used for each of the triangles a face consists of. Let's start with the front face here. It's obvious that we'll be using vertex 0, 1, 4 and 5, but in which order? Well, here it's important to first figure out what winding order Godot uses. Do we need to specify the vertices for a triangle in clockwise or counterclockwise order? Godot uses clockwise winding order, and this is why I often end up debugging here. In just about all math projects and OpenGL projects I've done before learning Godot, I've been using counterclockwise winding order. So here. I always forget this, I get confused, try to fix the problems in other ways, until I search for Godot winding order and realize my mistake. Okay, so this means that if we want to create our front face using these two triangles, we need the vertices to be ordered clockwise. The first triangle would then be using vertex 0, 4, and 5, and the other triangle would be made using vertex 0, 5, and 1. I'm then adding this to our face indices dictionary like this. I will encourage you to try to define the triangles for each of the faces yourself before using my data. It's important to remember that the clockwise winding order is based on you looking directly at the face from the outside. Next is the dictionary for the face normals. This should be relatively easy to get right, even though I did also mix up two of these when I made the preparations for this video. The normal for the top face is pointing up in the positive y direction. The right face has a normal pointing in the positive x direction. The front face has a normal pointing in the positive z direction, and then the opposite for the rest of the faces. The last dictionary we will be creating is mainly used for debugging. By adding a separate color for each face, it will be much easier to see what face has problems or not when we run and test later on. Now that we have all our data ready, it's time to connect it all into an array mesh. For this I'm creating a new method called addFace. This will take a face as input and the position of the cube the face is a part of. Here we'll then first get the indices for the face. For each of the triangles defined in the indices array, we go through the triangles indices and append the corresponding vertex position from the cube vertices array to our vertices array. And then here we also add the position where we want to place the cube. Then we add the face normal to the normals array and the face color to the color array. 
This should add all the data needed to draw this specific face. Finally, we call our add face method from the generate mesh method once for each face. And then we can call the generate mesh method from the ready method. Now we should be able to run the project and see our first little cube. Okay, so our cube is here, but it's just gray instead of the colors we defined for the faces. This is because we haven't added a material to the mesh that can use the colors. To fix this, I'm adding an exported variable for a material, and then I create the material from the inspector menu. Make sure you enable use as albedo for the vertex color. And then after we commit the mesh data, we can then also set the material for the mesh. When we run the project again, our cube should then be colored. If you're having any problems with the cube, then please go back and double check the cube vertices and the face indices. It's here that most problems occur. If triangles are missing from a face, then it's most likely because of the winding order, so make sure you select the vertices in the right order. The same goes if you have two triangles, but they are overlapping in some way, instead of forming a single face. This is most likely also because there's something wrong with the indices, but it could also be because there's something wrong with the vectors in the cube vertices array. Now that we can draw a single cube, we should also be able to draw all the cubes in our terrain. So let's make our generate mesh method take an array of vectors as input, and then for each position in the input, we draw all six faces as before, but now with the current position added to the call. Then in our world script, we first make a reference to the mesh instance. And then we call the generate mesh method on the mesh instance and pass the voxel data array to the method. Now we should have a mesh for our terrain. But is this better than the previous methods? Well, no. Or at least I don't even think it's worth profiling and comparing because we still need the most important optimization. For all the previous solutions, we created every single cube in the world. However, is this really necessary? Think of all the cubes that are hidden inside our terrain. We don't need these to be drawn because we won't ever see them. And this isn't only the case for the whole cubes. What about cube faces that are hidden behind other cubes? We don't need to draw these either. And this is exactly what we can take advantage of when we're creating our mesh from code. Before we place a face, we can check if there is a cube next to it. If this is the case, then we just won't draw that face. So let's create a new method that will check if a face at a given position has a neighbor. Here, we could just go through the whole data array and look for the position. But this array is huge when we scale our world up and we need to do this check six times for each cube. I think it would be better if we changed the data structure we're using to store our voxel data. If we're using a dictionary to store our voxel data and use the positions as the keys, then looking up a position will be much faster than when we use an array. If you want to understand why, then I suggest you try to learn about hash maps versus arrays. Each has their own advantages and disadvantages. Godot dictionaries are implemented as hash maps, 
and fast lookups are definitely what hash maps are for. If comparing data structures is something you think I should make videos on, then please let me know in the comments below. You can also read a comparison of array, dictionary and object in the Godot documentation. I've left a link to this in the description for this video. In our world script, we should then change our data to be of type dictionary. The keys should be vector threes, and then we can use the value to store additional data about our voxels. Why not add a color for each voxel for now? We then also need to make a change down where we insert a position for a new voxel. Here we can create a random color and insert this into our data dictionary using the position as the key. Back in our mesh script, we can then finish implementing the has neighbor method. The data should of course be a dictionary now. And then we start by computing the position of the neighbor using the position and the normal for the face. If our data dictionary has this position as a key, then we know that the face has a neighbor and we return true. Otherwise, we return false. And now we can update our mesh generation to only draw a face if it doesn't have a neighbor. To use the colors we just added for each voxel, we should also make a small change to our add face method and add the color every time this is called. When we run the project, only the surface of our terrain should now be rendered. Before we compare this new solution to the old one, I quickly want to show you how easily we can add collision to our terrain now. First we need to add a static body 3D and a collision shape to our mesh instance, and add a reference to the collision shape at the top of our mesh script. Then down, after we committed the generated mesh data to our mesh, we can generate a collision shape from the mesh using the create try mesh shape method, and then use this for our collision shape. It's really that easy. Now our terrain has collision again. Now that we created a new way to draw our voxel terrain, I suggest you try to profile it, test with different well sizes, and see how it performs. If you need help with how this is done, then please consider watching episode 3 of this series where we looked into the profiler tools in Godot. You might also want to try to do the same with the previous solution where we used GPU instancing and then compare the two. What are the pros and cons of each solution? Which do you prefer? And how do you think we should proceed now? Please let me know in the comments below. I hope you liked this video and remember to like, subscribe, hit the bell and all that if you want to see more like this in the future. Bye!